Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood, and I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. I want to welcome you to our first forum event of the year. There will be many, many more to come. But this is one of the, the reason that this is, we always do a first forum event uh, it, that is roughly around the title of Ask What You Can Do, Inspiring Public Service. Because public service, of course, is so central to everything that we do here at the Kennedy School, and specifically what the IOP focuses on, Institute of Politics. And so we're very much looking forward to uh, an active discussion. The way things will work here is I'll introduce our three panelists, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. Afterwards, those of you that have not been to the forum uh, before know that, uh, may not know that we have one rule at the Kennedy School, which is that forum speakers can come. When they come, they must take questions from the audience. Therefore, the audience must ask questions, or it's really very dull. Um, so uh, with that, let me just also say that I want to thank the, public, the Student Public Service Collaborative uh, to, and w for their help, and also that they'd like to extend a special invitation uh, to audience tonight. They have planned a volunteer opportunities fair uh, for, I guess it's Thursday, in the Taubman Rotunda uh, from 10.30 to 2.30. And we have the SPC's co-chair with us tonight, Tiffany McCormick. Where is Tiffany? There you are. Great. You might just stand up so people see you. That's great. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, many of you have heard me speak and welcome those of you to the school and so forth. Obviously, this is a place where everyone really does believe in making the world a better place really believes that you can make a difference, no matter of whether people call us naive or not. And indeed, I'm, as I've said before, I'm fond of saying that I'm the dean of one of the largest group of incredibly smart, naive people in the world. <laughs> and they're the ones that really make a difference. So tonight, we are joined by a group of people that have taken various different routes uh, into public policy and to make a difference. I should maybe start by saying that, unfortunately, one member of our group was unable to join us tonight, um, Karen Kornblum. And the reason for that is that she had a family emergency. Uh, she was the, she's a graduate of the MPP program back in 1988 and most recently has served as the uh, U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Economic uh, OECD, Cooperation and Development. But we are still joined by three terrific folks, and uh, let me turn to them now. And let me start by uh, uh, getting my listing here. Excuse me, one second. Um, let me start by introducing um, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Donnelly is a graduate of the MPAID program back in 2008. And um, what's very unusual about his, uh, not, like most people in the MPAID program, he came to the Kennedy School with a very strong background and we had strong in economics and math and so forth and so on. What is somewhat unusual, but far from unknown, is he decided while he was here, he got the bug, uh, took courses from, you know, like Pro Professor Jarding's class on running for office and so forth. And when he went back um, in late uh, 2010, he decided to run for office and became an MP uh, in, in, uh, in, in an independent TD uh, in Britain. Um, and he's, uh, um, uh, he, he came here after having worked for McKinsey and so forth. And he has had uh, a fascinating experience, uh, in, and we'll hear more about that uh, going forward. Um, second, uh, I'd like to introduce Paula Broadwell, um, she's a mid-career MPA 2008. Um, she uh, started as she is a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. Um, she's lived and worked and traveled all over the world, in Asia, Europe, and so forth. Um, during that time, she's had assignments with the U.S. Intelligence Community, Special Operations Command, FBI Joint Task Force, and the like. Most recently, she is known for having written a best-selling book. It's called All In, the Education of General David Petraeus. And uh, it was named by Foreign Policy Magazine as uh, a best read for 2012. So uh, welcome her as well. And finally, we have with us um, the, uh, someone who you will actually, those of you who are Kennedy School graduates, may get a chance to see um, after uh, this time and another occasion. Uh, he is the sheriff of Middlesex County. Uh, uh, sheriff Katusian is um, formerly was a uh, represented. Uh, um, is it Middlesex County? Newton Waltham. Newton Waltham. Okay, um, and 
and was on the in the legislature was on the chairman of the Joint Committee on Financial Services, uh, chairman of the Joint Committee on Public Health, commission to end racial and ethnic disparities, and so forth. But uh, not long ago, uh, when the when the position became vacant, he was named to be the sheriff of Middlesex County. And the reason uh, that this is relevant for all of us is there is a moment in the graduation, which is everyone's favorite moment. <laughs> and it involves the sheriff of Middlesex County. That is all I will say. Uh, those of you that want to see what this is must complete your scholarly work and graduate in order to see when you will see him again. So let me start uh, with Stephen. And um, Stephen, and ask um, what question that I'll ask all of you at some level, which is, first of all, what gets you up in the morning? And how did you kind of end up where you did? What, what led you on the sort of direction of public service that, that got you there? Yeah. Um, what gets me up every morning is my two- and three-year-old at about, <laughs> at about 6.45 telling me that they're hungry. Um, why do I do what I'm doing? So first of all, it's, it's Ireland, which is just, it'd be relevant to, to, to why, why I'm doing this. Um, as some people here will know, Ireland entered an IMF program in uh, late 2010. And there is currently some debate about whether they were forced into it or whether they went into it uh, uh, willingly. But I guess I had spent two years here in the ID program, and I'd spent a lot of time with people in the class who had been through IMF programs, and certainly what we were studying was, what do you do when the IMF comes into your country? So I had some knowledge of how bad it was going to get in Ireland. Um, I, there was, the, the, the banks were being recapitalized on the way to the IMF program. Uh, some of us saw it coming. And then on the 6 o'clock news, the national news in Ireland, the government had been denying it. As any of you were aware of how the IMF generally comes in, it's they're not coming, they're not coming, they're not coming, they're here. Um, <laughs> so the government was furiously explaining to everyone all weekend that they weren't coming. And then they were on the 6 o'clock news uh, walking through the city. And I had a feeling of... Uh, just embarrassment and shame to, to have been in this wonderful, developed, modern country that um, we actually did a case study during my time here on how, you know, how to do development, how to, how to get economic growth. Um, and I became really worried because I knew how bad things get, that I saw that, that it was going to be about 10 years, I would say, of really bad news of the country. Um, I knew that there was very little economic experience within our parliament, I knew through a combination of what I had learned here and the people I had got to know here and my background in consulting that I had something to add. Um, and I guess knowing those two things, knowing that it was going to get really, really bad and that I had something that I could add, if I didn't run, it would have been out of fear. Um, and it is a terrifying experience. <laughs> the fear is real, but I think it would have been out of fear. And uh, I... I discussed it at length with uh, my wife and decided to, decided to do it. What gets me up in the morning is trying to help my country get through a very difficult period. And what is your sense of how that's going at this stage? It's going really badly. Um, we're being held up as a poster child of the IMF, uh, just as Argentina was, as, as the fundamentals collapsed. Um, we have a debt-to-GDP ratio touching 120%. Um, our GNP is more important in Ireland because of all the U.S. Multi, multinationals. Um, it's way higher when you look at debt to GNP. We are, I think, the most heavily indebted country in terms of private debt in the world. Uh, we've got 15% unemployment. Uh, it's not going anywhere, and they're now transitioning to long-term unemployment. Um, our education system is collapsing. Our domestic economy is slowly being strangled by a lack of credit. Uh, by a banking sector that, first of all, destroyed the economy and now refuses to help it recover, even though we've poured more money into our banks per capita than any country on earth, I think, has ever done. Yeah, the crisis in Ireland really was a crisis of lending, and then the government came in. Is that fair? Yeah. It, well, first and foremost, it was, a, it, was a, it was the result of weak politicians. I think several, several administrations of weak politicians leading to weak in institutions, which allowed a bunch of very greedy bankers get completely out of control and do an awful lot of bad things, and then trick the government into bailing them out. 
Um, that's, that's what happened. So the story about Ireland is that we're doing well and we are the poster child of the European crisis and we're making all of these hard decisions. The reality is exactly the opposite. The reality is Iceland managed to push the burden of the, the banking losses back onto the bondholders. It's now growing again. Uh, Greece, which is in a lot of trouble, managed to get a massive write-down of the national debt. Spain managed to get a deal whereby the people would not have to capitalize the banks. This European uh, fund is going to do that. So we have managed to get the worst deal at every stage. Um, there is a very good story told about Ireland right now. I would love if it were true, um, but I don't think it is. I it is clear that you're an independent uh, TV, that's for sure, yeah. uh, with your, all your thoughts. Well, that's, that's – it's – but have your – the tools and so forth that you learned in the school been of use to you? Yeah, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. Um, I, 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 tremendously. I mean, I, I learned a huge amount of economics. I learned a lot of negotiation. I learned from Professor Jarding how to get elected. That was very useful. Um, <laughs> I would say there wasn't. Now, I can, can say certainly there isn't a single class that I did here that I haven't actively used in the last uh, year and a half. It was phenomenal. And the second part, of course, is the people. So when I decided to run, um, a bunch of people from my class actually came over and, and helped. Right. Um, so that was, uh, it was incredibly useful in, in every way. So I've been dean a long time. I've never had someone say every single class was invaluable. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think it was. I'm, He's I'm a glad. politician. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, it seems like a truth teller, doesn't he? Um, Paula, so let, same question for you. What gets you up in the morning? How did you, um, and you, again, you started at West Point. You've had a, a remarkable military career. Now you're in a kind of different realm. But talk, tell us about that. Sure. Well, um, Stephen stole my answer. My five- and six-year-olds wake me up now in the morning. Um, but I think it, it, even now and, and from throughout my life, what's woken me up in the morning is a desire to be consequential. And that's why I came to the Kennedy School, truly, to find a way to have a larger impact and influence the greater good. And I've always kind of been driven by that. And you, you gave us this question in advance, and I was thinking, what, what, you know, surely it was motivated earlier, what happened when, as a child or in junior high or high school. But um, I think my parents really instilled that, that um, need to serve something greater than yourself. And I knew I would always do that, but I didn't even think about the military until the first Gulf War was on. It was 1990, and I was going to go to Georgetown and be a diplomat of some sorts. And I remember watching the Gulf War, and it was this shock and awe campaign. It was over. You know, there was, a, there was an air campaign and then a ground war that lasted a couple of days, and we were done. Greatest military in the world. Um, we spend more on our defense than all of the countries combined right now, six times more than China, our biggest potential conventional threat. And I thought, I need to understand that instrument of power so that if I'm a leader in some capacity, I don't abuse it. Um, and so that sort of started me down the path of going to West Point. Now, I didn't exactly know what I was getting into there. I knew it was public service and leadership, but when I showed up and I got issued socks and you know, undergarments and everything was issued and it had to be folded in a certain way and we had to march, um, I realized I was getting into something um, really important. And it changed my life. The mission of the United States Military Academy is much like the mission here, but it's to develop leaders of character who serve the common defense. And I love that. And I love the Army motto at the time, which was, be all you can be. So it was just this belief that you can be something, you can make a difference in the world, and I'm so grateful for my military journey. Um, so you mentioned a few of the assignments I had. Those have all been very exciting and dynamic and, and a lot for a young girl from the Midwest who wasn't sure she'd be anything but had big dreams. Um, even coming to Harvard was, was that for me. But um, after 9-11, and um, I had left active duty, and I got recalled involuntarily three times. I was happy to go, but my husband wasn't so happy, so we called it involuntary. Um, but I was sent overseas and working with Special Operations Command and serving on the, on the front lines and seeing the sacrifices our troops were making, more than I was because I wasn't in combat, but these repeat tours, this... this um, unshakable willingness to serve the country and go back and, and you know, live through these hardships of family separation, of seeing your buddies die, and so forth. And so as I left active duty and started a family and had to decide between the military and, and, and um, the mother route for a while, um, I realized there were other ways to serve, and that was joining the reserves. And so a neat motto in the reserves that I really embraced is twice the citizen. You can 
have a corporate job or be a soccer mom, but you can serve in the reserves and still be ready to serve your country. And I really embrace that. So that's what I do now, teaching at West Point um, and writing this book about General Petraeus. But using the platform and having the stage, if you will, to bring more awareness to what our veterans who are returning from these wars are going through and our wounded warriors. And I'd love to talk about that a little bit later, but um, that's what's brought me here where I am at today. Sounds good. And so uh, one of the things, by the way, you should know uh, is never get into a push-up contest with her. <laughs> uh, she was on John Stewart, uh, and uh, she challenged uh, John Stewart to a push-up contest uh, in, for charity. And uh, it was pretty sad, <laughs> not on her part. No, he's a hero for uh, it's going a, was for that? It. He, We have to respect him for being willing to. <laughs> he did it. G give him credit for that, absolutely. And I think he's, he's learned his lesson. Um, but so uh, you've been involved with, uh, you've seen leadership in various levels of various ways before. Um, you watch General Petraeus and so forth. Are there two or three things that you think are kind of essential that here is a group of people that would like to be young leaders? What are, the, what are the characteristics of great leadership that you've seen? Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful question. And um, I would f say first and foremost is integrity. Because if somebody doesn't believe you're telling the truth, you will lose them as a follower, for sure. And I think you'll lose your faith in yourself as well. Um, living your values, that sort of reflects having integrity. And um, you know, another thing is having a vision, but being able to carry it out. So Petraeus likes to talk about what his four key tasks of a strategic leader are. And they're in the book, if you want to pick up a book. Uh, I think I have a book talk tomorrow. I can share more. But basically... Sorry, I didn't bring a cop. No, that's okay. I should have brought one. Um, basically, get the big ideas right. So you have to have a vision. And he talks about his, his time in Iraq where we were focused on just killing the enemy instead of protecting the population and getting them to support our troops over there so that we could um, then train and equip them to fight for themselves. And the concept applies to Iraq and Afghanistan, obviously. But you have to have that big idea right. And then you have to communicate it to your entire force, if you will. For him, that was you know, the active duty military, that was Congress, that were other, those were other decision makers in the US. It was the American public, because if you remember, at the height of violence in the Iraq war, I know I didn't believe in the war. I was a conscientious objector. So someone had to communicate to the public that we could win this war, and we had the means to do it, and this is how it's going to happen. Um, and the troops had to know how to do it. So get the big ideas right, communicate them, and then oversee their execution. You can't just delegate without going out to see that the local commander understands the local solution. Like all politics are local, all insurgencies are local too. And every village is different in Iraq and Afghanistan and around the world for that, for that matter. Um, so you have to oversee the execution. And then the fourth point he likes to talk about is creating some kind of lessons learned feedback mechanism. So you as a leader are learning what's working and what's not and your organization can find best practices and institutionalize them and continue to improve. Um, to quote Sun Tzu, he who adapts fastest generally wins. And if the enemy is adapting faster than you are or your organization is, then you can predict who the outcome, what the outcome will be. So I asked uh, Stephen about Ireland. Maybe you can give us your current views on uh, Iraq and Afghanistan based on what you've seen. What's the real question? <laughs> um, so well, we can talk about this in several contexts. but. Um, I don't think we'll know the outcomes of either war for, for decades, frankly. Um, Iraq has devolved a little bit into sectarian violence, um, but I think that the Iraqi security forces are doing a decent job of protecting and defending citizens. They're trying to build their own capacity. One thing that's critical in, in encountering insurgency is having a legitimate government who can provide for the governance and economic development that is part of a civil military comprehensive counterinsurgency plan. So the military can't do that all alone. We had to provide you know, State Department and other civilian officials to, to coach them, if you will, and, and you know, see one, do one, teach one. Um, but finally, the Iraqis were able to provide that for themselves. Um, so there's mo I have more hope in a positive outcome in Iraq than Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, we have a little bit, and this is Paula's opinion, um, not the government's opinion, but I think Karzai is a little bit, bit more of a difficult partner. There's more rampant corruption. There was not as much of an infrastructure there. Um, and governance and development are much, much more difficult. Um, on the other hand, there are 350,000 Afghan National Security Forces. They're doing a pretty decent job of providing for security. Um, we've heard about the green on blue incidents, which is basically Afghan soldiers that are embedded with our soldiers, but who are conducting fratricide. And that is alarming for the command, and they're trying to do something about it. 
But some in the command think that's a sign that the Taliban is is um, is desperate for some other tactic to to sort of scare us off. Um, nobody thinks that Afghanistan will become like Switzerland, but the hope is that we will prevent Al Qaeda from ever setting up camp there again, mm -hmm. training and equipping and, and targeting us. Um, and that there will be at least stability so that um, they can protect and defend themselves from in internal threats and other threats coming out across the border from Pakistan. But um, it's very difficult, as you know. We'll come back. Peter, what gets you up in the morning? These two stole my answer. <laughs> my nine, three, and uh, my nine, seven, and three year olds uh, get me up. Uh, but aside from them waking me up, what gets me going for the day, it's, uh, it's really the feeling that I can make a difference every day in everything that I do. It's what really drives me um, and has driven me for many years now. And it's a sort of a feeling or a skill set or a, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, uh, something that I sort of learned a little bit later in life. Uh, I attended a state school when I graduated from high school, and like many young men, I thought as soon as I graduated, it didn't matter my GPA, it didn't matter my success inside the school. I simply have to get the certificate. Uh, those, those doors would open and the world would come, you know, just saying, you know, Peter, we've been waiting for you, man. <laughs> I, I think many young men have this uh, sort of uh, uh, misunderstanding of real life. And uh, I didn't, uh, you know, I graduated unceremoniously and, uh, and staggered around. And I think part of my career, and I'd like to tell people out, is a little bit about stumbling and staggering and finding your place, too. And it's okay sometimes. Um, and so I, for a couple of years I worked, and... And then I said, boy, I, I've got to figure out what I'm doing here. And I'd never thought about it before, but said, maybe I'll try law school. And so I attended New England School of Law here downtown. And I worked harder my first semester than I did in all four years of my undergraduate. And, and I graduated. I didn't graduate with straight A's, but I graduated, and I did pretty well. And I went out, and I became a, a, a defense attorney for, for about a year and a half. And it was during that time, and, and this is what I mean, sometimes you find yourself doing things because of what your experience is. And, I was doing some uh, criminal defense work for the indigent, and, and I was running into a couple of prosecutors that I didn't think were doing the right thing. You know, the, the role of a defense attorney is to zealously defend your uh, client within the bounds of the law. But the role of a prosecutor is much different. It's to seek justice. And I really felt like in many cases um, that the prosecutors were not doing so. And so I actually then sought to become a prosecutor. And, and uh, I was very fortunate to have been chosen under... Uh, District Attorney Tom Riley in Middlesex County uh, to become a prosecutor in Middlesex County. And I served there for four years, and during which time I got to teach a bit. And then it was at the time when I was thinking, I've really got to, um, you know, I've seen too many prosecutors stay in the office for too long, and then it's, it, it really limits your ability to move on sometimes. And I knew I had to make a move. And it was at that time when we had a, as you had said, Stephen, I had a, 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 a legislator that was in my district that was someone that um, I just simply thought I could do better than. I mean, it's simply put, um, I've got a couple of people that would have known that gentleman here. And, you know, he was a good man, and he worked hard, um, but I just thought that I could do a little bit better. Uh, I wanted to make the district proud to say someone was their state representative, and I didn't feel that way. Uh, and I ran. And uh, we were very successful. As a matter of fact, my campaign was run by Doug Rubin, Dean, who you know is a great savant of politics now in Massachusetts. Uh, and he was my first campaign manager. Uh, we defeated this incumbent two to one. Uh, and since then, it has been the, the drive and the desire to know that I can make a difference. I think it's important, too, Dean, that, that people understand. For me, it's a, it's a desire to do good. My, my mother was a teacher. My father was a city clerk, you know, civil servants, modest people. I don't have the hard luck story that every, every presidential and vice presidential candidate has nowadays. I didn't grow up on the ragged edge of middle class, uh, you know, uh, but a modest home in, in Waltham, just outside here. Um, and, I, and I've been able to achieve uh, some very good things, and I've been very fortunate. But it's the desire to make the change. And then it's also, it's sort of a carrot and stick, the way that I think of it, because every day I desire to make the change or I desire to do some good and to change the world in a better way. But there's also that stick, and it's a feeling of responsibility. It's a feeling that I, if I don't do it, this is a very real feeling that I would have in the legislature a great deal of time when someone would wander into my office that wasn't a constituent or an issue that didn't seem to be particularly popular. If I don't do it, someone else will do it. They won't do it as well, or no one will do it. And that has been a feeling, and, and my wife Elizabeth, who's here with me, will tell you, I take on a great deal of things because I really feel like sometimes if I'm not the one that's going to try and help someone out, they just may not be that person. And that's, it, it's those two driving factors, the desire to do good, and then the feeling of responsibility 
uh, that perhaps a skill set that I developed even through the Kennedy School that makes me able to do some things that some other people either may not be able to do or will not desire to do at the same time. And what ultimately led you now uh, you, to want to get into law enforcement again from the legislature? I mean, what did you see of the pros and cons of each of these things? Is it just different chapters? How do you think about it? So this is another stumble in my life, Dean, all right? You know, you want to talk about an accidental career in many ways? The watchwords of my life, I've got a couple of watchwords. Uh, my greatest motivating factor is uh, not the desire for success, but the fear of failure or the fear, fear of, of, of looking stupid, quite honestly, in my, my, my trial days, the fear of looking stupid or getting caught off guard, not the desire to look great. Um, but it's this. It's the harder I work, the luckier I get. I think Jefferson said that, right? And that is what I have truly found in my life. Um, I never dreamed of being sheriff. It's something that never occurred to me in a million years. As a matter of fact, my predecessor was a very different model of who I am and it was what I thought the model of what a sheriff was. Uh, and it wasn't what I sought to be. Uh, and so when initially he resigned and people came to me and said, would you be interested in this position? My first thoughts were, no, not really, but I never say never. Another set of watchwords that I will hope to imbue upon you, never say never. Um, and I looked into that position and I said, man, I really want to be sheriff. Now, the only reason I was able to be sheriff was not, uh, you know, it was because I had worked so hard, I had raised my money, see, right, you know, you'd raise your money, so I had that. I had raised my profile, had done a lot of great work on victims' rights and, and, and women's rights and, and, and on and mental health and substance abuse and all the things that, you know, again, all kind of came together in an amalgam that made me sort of a good candidate to be sheriff. But it was all the work that I did to that point that got me to be able to be selected as sheriff of Middlesex County, which, which, by the way, is one of the largest counties in the entire country, the largest in New England, about 1.6 million people. It is a phenomenal, the oldest, uh, bill, you know, it was, uh, it was created in 1690. Um, so it's an amazingly historic and powerful position. And, and again, as the dean meant, well, I, I'll leave that for your surprise. You have to graduate to watch what I do on graduation. Uh, but it's something very special, I can promise you that. And um, what, where did the Kennedy School fit in all this? Well, I was in the legislature. Uh, as a matter of fact, I remember my first day, and I just have to tell you about my first day. It was, I'm a kid from Waltham, and I'm walking across that, the Harvard Bridge. I parked by the stadium. I think I found some spot. I probably got a ticket. I remember walking for the orientation on a beautiful summer day and watching the people rowing under that bridge and, uh, and getting just chills. I might even get emotional talking about it, thinking about, you know, that I was able to attend Harvard, you know. It was really special. And thinking about my grandparents were all deceased and how proud they would have been to see me this, to see me here. It came with a graduation day where my wife was you know, almost nine months pregnant or, you know, eight months pregnant with my son, Peter. Um, you know, it came, it, came, it came in so many ways. It came with the friendships that I developed here that I still have throughout the country and throughout the world. Uh, it came because I wanted to better myself. And I've always felt that education, you know, again, I learned it a little bit late, but I learned it, that education was really crucial to developing yourself. And I knew the skill sets that I could continue to develop, the friendships and the associations I would make here would serve me well. Never knowing that I'd actually have, you know, I was a legislator, but getting a, a master's, you know, in, in, in public administration would actually, I'd get a job where I would actually use my master's in public administration. And I did use all my, my um, courses, but probably the primary ones that I use the most are the crisis management courses, which help me probably more than almost anything else right now in my job presently. So this is a question for all of you, but um, this is a time when people are feeling kind of discouraged about governments in general, about our capacity to solve the hardest problems. Even the military, the U.S. military, which is held in very high esteem, again, the concerns about where are we headed in Afghanistan and to some degree uh, where, where is Iraq headed. Um, and so um, how do you, does that affect your capacity to get things done? Does that motivate you? Uh, how do you think about all that? I don't know. Paul, why don't you start? Yeah, sure. Um, it absolutely motivates me. In fact, I think it's not a problem that government can't solve everything because I think our communities need to try to solve things, and sometimes a bottom-up solution can be the best solution. Um, I'll give the example of, of helping wounded warriors. So coming back from these wars, we have about, about 2.4 million tours have been conducted in, since the war on terrorism, since 9-11, I should say. Um, and about a third of the, the forces who've gone over have gone over more than once. Um, of the troops coming back, we've, we've, we've seen 7,000 approximately make the ultimate sacrifice. They've passed away or been killed in action. We have 45,000 troops who are physically wounded. They have shrapnel or some kind of injury. 
Um, and 2,000 of those have amputation, many of them double amputees. Some of them, all four of their limbs are gone. So those numbers, um, you know, 45,000 injured, 2,000 amputees, but 530,000, so 10 times the number of physical wound, physically wounded, 530,000 have some kind of invisible wound, like post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, where they are unable to reintegrate back into our society. And let me also tell you that only 60% of veterans use the VA, so I think there's probably twice that many, maybe a million, who have some kind of, um, some kind of stress, and it shouldn't be a negative thing, it's not a disorder, but it's a very real and traumatic experience for them. Amongst the veteran population, there is a 30% increase in sexual violent crimes. There's a 40% increase in child abuse. The suicide rate is higher than the national average, and 18 veterans commit suicide um, a month. Um, I think in the first 154 days of this year, 154 active duty troopers committed suicide. And then the VA receives 17,000 calls a day on their suicide hotline. Now, if we expect our government to deal with that, they just don't have the capacity. I don't care who's in the administration. So I feel that we, um, as public citizens, or you when you go back to your countries if you're not from America, have um, some kind of moral calling to help others who have served your country. And so that's, you know, I don't, I don't feel um, disparaged about that the government's not doing enough, but I've put my, placed my efforts in trying to help those in my community by supporting this group called Team Red, White, and Blue, giving book proceeds to them, talking about them every chance I get, trying to draw awareness to um, some of the activities going on in our community that are trying to help veterans reintegrate and help wounded warriors get through some of their issues and find new jobs and deal with um, financial loss and so forth. So um, I'm trying to focus on the positive. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think the solution is to, to, if you don't think the government's doing something right, then do something about it. And this is something I'm passionate about, and that's what I'm focusing on. Stephen, that sort of, sort of uh, uh, is what you decided to do. But what's it like? I mean, are people pretty upset with government in Ireland at this stage? Are yeah. they? And, but can you somehow turn that on its head and use it as a motivation? Or how do you think about it? Yeah, you can. So the latest data I saw shows that something like three in every four Irish people polled believe nothing at all that their political leaders tell them. Nothing. And uh, having been in politics for a year and a half, I'd say the other one in four haven't realized that they are being lied to all the time. <laughs> Um, it is extraordinary. No, no wait, I just want to be clear. You are a politician. You I am a politician. Talk to people, so I, <laughs> I do. Trying to figure out where that. Some of them gets, tell the truth. Some of them okay, tell the oh, truth. Okay, well, but it is it, it, it is extraordinary. I have sat in. There was a there was a referendum in Ireland, a very important referendum in Ireland uh, recently, and I was doing a radio interview with the lead government spokesperson who was advocating a, a, a yes, and I was advocating uh, a no, and he said his piece, and he and I had been speaking ahead of time. Um, and he said his piece, and we were in, we were in the Parliament studio, so we were on our own, and the, 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 the radio producer, was the, the presenter, was miles away. And uh, she said, you know, Stephen, what do you think? And I said, well, I said, first of all, everything that you've just been told, he doesn't believe, right? And he sat there. No one else could see us, and he sat there going, none of us, I don't, you know. He, and I, I know he didn't believe it. I spoke to him ahead of time. Um, but he had to say it, you know, because he's in a party, and the party decides... Um, so a point I made in various referendums in Ireland was a lot of the politicians you hear speak not only don't believe what they're telling you, but, but passionately believe the opposite of what they're telling you. And people are not stupid. And people in Ireland have been lied to, and they have been spun, and they have been treated like idiots. Um, and I've been talking to a, to a bunch of friends of mine over the, the, the weekend. We were, I was here at a wedding. And they were saying that that, the, that faith in Congress is at an all-time low, that has been called a do-nothing Congress. And I'm hearing an awful lot of parallels, right? So does that make it very difficult to try and be a new type of politician? Yes, it does. On a personal level, it makes it very difficult. I was in the playground last Saturday with my, my two kids, and this gentleman got very upset with me, got very angry, he started cursing at me, he became physically very threatening. I had to call the police. And say, so, look, you, you've got to go away. I'm here with my kids. You know, you don't know me. You, know, you don't know anything about me. Um, he may have had very, very good reason to be very angry in his life. And as far as he's, he's never met me before in his life. I'm the man. I am the establishment. And the establishment has probably uh, not helped this guy in his life. Now, 
Um, so what do you do about that? You try and tell the truth. And you try and bring what you learn from the Kennedy School into politics. And when government ministers stand up and say, this is how we're going to spend tens of billions of euro, you stand up and say, why? Show me the evidence. And they kind of look at you and say, but you don't, you don't need any evidence. In fact, one of them said, I'd give it to you, but you wouldn't understand it. <laughs> I said, well, you know, try me. I probably will. Um, so you try and tell the truth. I, I was in a taxi about two months ago in Dublin, so not in my own constituency. And it was nighttime, and I was in jeans and a dark shirt. Guy didn't recognize me. We got to talking about politics. Um, and he started having a go at politicians. Uh, but it was a very, very informed rant. It wasn't just they're all the same, they're all liars. He knew the people, he knew the lies. And as the, as the, as the cab ride went on and on, he got more and more agitated. And he became more and more cutting to the point that I was sitting there kind of getting quite uncomfortable thinking, God, I'm not going to tell this guy I'm one of them. <laughs> He'll punch me. And just as we were getting to where he was dropping me off, he said, however, there's one guy in there who, when I hear him speak, when I hear him on the radio, when I see him on the television, I believe him. And I thought, oh, this could be great or this could be terrible. <laughs> And he said he's a young guy. It's great. Another thing about going into politics, at 36 years of age, everyone describes he was young, which is fantastic. Um, and he said some very complimentary things, and he said he knows his economics and so forth. And he said, and his name is Stephen Donnelly. And I didn't tell him who I was. I was just so happy. I got out of the cab, and I smiled for about four days. But, <laughs> you know... Absolutely. That's, that's take one to the bank. Right. right. <laughs> so if you can walk into a system where people are rightly, completely disillusioned, with the Irish political system, because it has let them down entirely. And you can reach through to one guy who's a total stranger, who isn't even in your constituency, who says, I believe that guy. Then that's probably, he's probably not the only one. And so you, day by day and, and you know, hour by hour, hopefully, with other good politicians, there's other fantastic people in there, um, you, you try and rekindle a bit of faith and a bit of integrity and a bit of honesty in, in, in politics. Peter? Every time there is a um, bad story about an elected official, I feel it. You know, I don't, it's not like a punch in my face, it's a punch in my gut. It takes the wind out of me. Because as Stephen said, you know, I work really hard to bring honor to this profession to do the right thing. That's why I ran in the very first place. I mean, this is the reason I ran, because I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make people be proud to say I was their state representative. Be proud to say I supported Peter. I, I contributed to Peter. I, I'm Armenian-American like Peter, right? You know, any reason, you know, I'm, I'm one of his constituents. I wanted to make people proud to say that I was their legislator, their elected official. And every time I hear someone getting beaten up, and sometimes it's rightfully so, right? I mean, you know, sadly, there's a lot of people that make mistakes in their lives, and a lot of them are politicians, too. And I don't know if there are any more or less than the general population, but we certainly have our share of people that make blunders and make terrible ethical errors, and, and, and they bring disrepute to an entire profession that should be noble and strong and good. And so what happens is there's a cycle that begins because the more that this profession, by the way, in, 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 in polling will show, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, I think in uh, the United States, I don't know what the number is, it might be single digits, approve of Congress, right? You know, 7%, 9%, 12%, whatever it is, is really low. But in their, as to their own congressmen, the approval rate is much higher, right? So it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic that they don't like the body like Parliament, but they will like their own congressman, their own elected official, because it's someone that they know more than a, this body that's out there. But the more that there are these stories where someone else is bringing some disrepute to an entire profession, then the less people want to become engaged in that profession, and the less good people want to participate in that profession. And so this is a great opportunity to speak to those graduates from the, the Harvard Kennedy School, or I know that we've got some undergraduates here. Don't let that deter you. Use that as a reason to, to take up you know, that staff in charge and, and to make that difference and to try. And, you know, when I was at the Kennedy School, you know, Stephen, you probably remember, a lot of people said, I want to run for office when I get back. Well, not so fast, right? You can't, you can't come back to your district with a, with a Harvard degree and say, hey, here I am, elect me, right? Now, you know, in, in, in the, I know that Harvard influence is greater the farther you get away from Harvard, right? So around Waltham, is, you know, it's, it's, sure. it's only so much, you know. He's <laughs> a Harvard boy. Quite as much in Ireland. Yeah, he's a Harvard boy, right, you know? Um, 
But, but the fact is that you want more people to participate. And so I ask you to get involved and to participate. And it may not be running for office the second you finish your degree. It might be just supporting, working with. It might be you know, becoming a coach in Little League or becoming part of some community groups so that you can build that sphere of influence, make that difference. And then at some point, maybe you might be ready to go. Um, but to get out there and try, because, you know, and that's part of the reason I continue. My wife sometimes gets, you know, not frustrated, but she sometimes wonders. You know, why do you keep doing this? Because I think I can make a difference, and I think that I can bring some positivity to something by working by, in a bipartisan fashion, by being straight, by being honest with, with press, being honest with people, um, and, and being noble in what you're trying to do, and hopefully bring some, um, some honor and good repute to a profession that's suffering greatly and then reflects on the rest of our government, as Paula said. Uh, it's terrific. And by the way, I think every person who graduates from Harvard believes that there's at least one great politician in, in, in Boston. Um, and you'll just have to wait and see. So we have microphones in these four, in four locations. Was one right here, one up in there, one there, and one here. And I'd like to encourage you to go to the microphone. And let me describe what a good question is at the Kennedy School. Uh, it is, number one, you start by identifying yourself. Number two, it's short and contains one thought. And number three is it ends with a question mark. Um, so go ahead and ask a question of the panel. I have some more myself, but why don't we start right over here. Hi, my name is Sinead O'Flanagan, and I'm a senior lecturer at MIT. And I 